Welcome to Up and Down Again, a migrations tale, where together we're going to journey into the inner workings of Rails schema management. My name is Derek Pryor. If you have feedback or questions about this talk as it's ongoing, you can tweet me at Derek Pryor, email me at Derek at ThoughtBot.com, or afterwards you can come up and introduce yourself, ask me questions, tell me what you thought about the, tell me what you thought about the talk, and tell me how your conference has been going. I'd love to talk to as many of you as possible. So I currently work as a development director at ThoughtBot, where I've been working now for five years. Uh, I want to thank, just take a quick moment to thank ThoughtBot for the remarkable opportunity to do things like this and to contribute to open source and to contribute to our local communities. It's one of the things I value most about working there. A lot of people use our gems and are familiar with ThoughtBot but aren't particularly sure what it is we actually do. So at ThoughtBot, we work with our clients to build great digital products. If you want to learn more about what that means to work with us as a client or what it means to work with me as a coworker in any of our six locations, then please come see me afterwards or send me an email or tweet me. Okay, so we're here today to talk about schema management in Rails. The first version with what we'd recognize as migration support came in Rails 0.10.1, which was released towards the end of 2005. As far as I've been able to tell, it's actually the first open source implementation of any sort of conventional schema management system that allowed developers to uh, progress their database schema along with, the required, along with the code that required that database schema. And that's a pattern that became so immediately useful that it's hard to imagine a web framework that doesn't allow for such a thing these days. So I really wanted to dive in and see what makes it tick. So our agenda for today, the first thing we're gonna do is look at what makes up the migration DSL, what actually happens when we apply or revert a migration, how schema.rb gets generated and what it's used for, and finally, where some of this falls short and how we might overcome that. So let's dive into the anatomy of a migration. Here's a pretty, looking, pretty common looking migration to create a table, our post table, which is gonna have five columns or so with some restrictions and things like that. The intrigue for me really starts right here on line one which is with a relatively recent addition to migrations, which I think came in, in Rails 5. The reason why it's interesting is it looks like we're inheriting from an instance of an array, which I can pretty much assure you is not code you've ever written anywhere else in Ruby or Rails. So I wanted to know what's going on under the hood here. So the, the way to answer that is to, to crack open the migration class itself, and we can see that that defines the brackets method. So we're not actually indexing into an array, we're calling this method with the version that we passed to it. And that method hands off to compatibility.find. And that compatibility.find call isn't an active record.find call, rather it's a call to the compatibility module method find. And what that does is take the version that you pass in, turn it into a string, do, do a little bit of error handling, and then spit out a constant. So basically, it's a, long, it's a way to turn this here into this much longer form. So the brackets are clearly shorter and maybe nicer to type, but I have a suspicion it's really only done for aesthetical re aesthetics reasons because uh, how many of you are actually typing an entire migration class by hand? Usually you generate those and you get the class name and things like that by hand. But nonetheless, that's how we arrive at what we're inheriting from. So what does that class actually look like under the hood? This is it. So it's empty. <laughs> so we've gone an awfully long way already, and all we're doing is essentially inheriting from migration directly. So why don't we just inherit from migration like we used to back in Rails 4.2 and forever before that? Well, the answer is that Rails won't let us. The inherited callback that you see here gets defined after we define that v5.2 constant. And what, it, what that does is it has the effect of any time from that point on when somebody inherits from migration, we check the direct superclass and say, if the direct superclass is migration directly, then raise, because that's not supported anymore. So why was this change made? Why is, it, why is it not supported anymore? It might help to answer that question by looking at a slightly different example, where instead of inheriting from 5.2, we're inheriting from 5.1. So that's gonna, change the con that's gonna change the class that we're actually inheriting from. If we look up its compatibility class, we can see that it looks like this. So these classes are essentially compatibility shims. They allow us to see how, a migration, how migration behavior changes between releases. They encapsulate how a migration behaved up to and including that particular version. So here we can see that 5.2 must have changed how Postgres handles change column. And similarly, 5.2 must have changed how MySQL handles create table. And if we wanted to see how that was done, we could dive into the code and run a git blame on it or we could read the code and see if we can figure it out. There's lots of different ways we can see, but this is a nice place to come in and see what exactly has changed between the versions. All of this work is done. It's a, it's a lot of work that was, wasn't done previously, and all of it was added uh, 
in the name of, sta of having stable migrations, which I think is a cause for celebration because having stable migrations weren't always the case. What it does is it gives us the confidence that me the meaning of our migrations don't change when we upgrade Rails versions. So it used to be that if you had reason to revert an old migration after having updated Rails versions, or for whatever reason reapply an old migration, you may not end, you may not end up with the same schema that you had when you originally wrote that migration. So this change was introduced to fix that problem. So let's keep going. Here's our change method. We're gonna talk about the semantics of change itself a little bit later, but let's dive into its body. So this is our create table statement. Create table is what is known internally as a schema statement. If you look up the documentations, if you look up the documentation for schema statements, you'll see a bunch of things here. This is a truncated screenshot of that. And you'll see lots of familiar things like create table, add column, add index, remove index, things like that. But if you look at the documentation, you may also see some things that might be unfamiliar to you, things like change column null, change column default. There's lots of things that you can do in migrations that you might not be aware of, so I do suggest when you, when you get a moment to look at, these, look at these statements and see if perhaps you were doing something the long way when there was a nice, easy Rails helper for you to do it. So each line of this migration is packed with a decent amount of meaning, and it seems like each, each recent version of Rails has added the ability to pack more meaning, particularly into those belongs to type lines where you're referencing another table. So for example, this first line here has, depending on how you count them, up to four-ish jobs. So the jobs we're doing in that one line, we're adding a non-nullable user ID to create table. So we're saying, hey, this table needs a user ID, and it also cannot be null. That's our null false part. We're adding an index to the user ID column. So we want to be able to do quick lookups on that field or quick joins. Uh, that used to be an additional statement in your migration. Now we can just add it as a property to the line. We want to add a foreign key to the user's table so we maintain referential integrity to say, like, if there's an ID here in our user ID column, it must point to a valid ID in our users table. Otherwise, we have bad data. And the, this, again, is something that you used to do separately, but now you can do inside of your create table statement directly. So when we run this entire migration, we run rake db migrate on this, with this migration, Postgres will spit out SQL that looks like this. MySQL will give us something different. And they differ in many ways. The things that jump out at me immediately are things like column type. So here on MySQL, we can see that the ID column is of type big int, whereas if we jump back to Postgres, we can see that it's big serial. I don't need to know that as a Rails developer, right? That, that, that concept is compressed for us. Um, <laughs> there's other things in here as well, like the number of statements differs. MySQL, we can, all do, we can do this in what is, what, what is known as one SQL DDL statement. I believe DDL stands for data definition language. All right, Sean's telling me I got it right. Um, uh, and, in my, and in Postgres, we actually, end, we actually end up executing five, because Postgres allows us to create the table and the foreign key constraint, but then we have to create the indexes separately. But again, something I don't need to know as a Rails developer, it just happens for me automatically. Quoting styles differ, so Postgres uses what you might expect, double quotes, or maybe you expected single quotes, but it uses double quotes, and MySQL uses backticks. Who knows why? So the reason why, the, the reason we're able, the, the way we're able to get differing SQL out of the same Ruby is through what is known as the adapter pattern. So the adapter pattern converts the interface of a class into another interface that clients expect. Adapter lets classes work together that couldn't otherwise because of incompatible interfaces. And that quote is from the Design Patterns book, which is a pretty famous book and often called the Gang of Four book because it had four authors. And it's a book that I like to pretend to have read and quote from often. <laughs> So what it basically means in this case is we have a group of external dependencies, and ideally each of these external dependencies would provide a consistent interface, but unfortunately they don't. That is the role of our connection adapters. Our connection adapters give us that, that consistent interface to talk to each one of these things. So we start with the abstract adapter, which defines all of the ways that Rails wants to talk to each one of these interfaces. And you'll see the abstract adapter actually defined in the Rails source. You'll also see things like the Postgres SQL adapter, the MySQL 2 adapter, the SQLite 3 adapter, any other adapters that Rails supports. And those adapters actually go about implementing the specifics of the abstract adapter. So the abstract adapter is the interface that these have to adhere, adhere to. This is actually a really common pattern throughout Rails. You'll see it in things like Action Cable, Active Job, et cetera. And it should also be something you're familiar, you should get familiar with in your own applications. Really, it's a useful pattern any time that you have to communicate with an external dependency, and that may be like another system that you control, or it may be something like S3, 
And the reason why I find it useful, even if I'm only talking to like one, of, one other thing, is it allows me to define the language that I want to talk to that thing in a way that makes sense to my application. And then inside the particular adapter, I can translate that into what it means to talk to, for example, S3. So our connection adapters here have many responsibilities. First, we reflect on the, we reflect on the schema, right? Which tables are defined, what columns are on those tables, which columns are indexed. How do we generate a create table statement on this database, for example? If we say, if we, say we want a string in a migration, what does that mean on this database? So in MySQL, you'll see that that's a varchar 255 by default. And on Postgres, you'll see that it's character varying. Again, something I don't need to know as somebody who writes Ruby is taken care, of, taken care of for me by the people who manage these connection adapters. Uh, does this particular database support foreign keys? Does it support the JSON type? Does it support save points in transactions? Um, these types of things can influence not only how migrations work, but how active record statements get run uh, at runtime. And quoting, another example that we saw earlier. And there's other responsibilities as well, but these are the ones that jumped out at me. So by passing that Ruby through the, by passing the Ruby through these adapters, that's how we generate the SQL that we saw and actually change our database in a way that makes sense to the underlying database. So I want to talk for a minute about how, how we actually go about running those migrations. So of course, we apply a migration with Rails DB migrate, but how does Rails know which migrations will run? To answer that, I want to start by looking at the, the file name that gets generated when you create a migration. The thing on the left, the part on the left, the integer on the left, you might recognize as an integer version of a timestamp. And the part on the right is the name that you pass to the generator, or the name of your class. Rails looks at this a little bit more specifically. The thing on the left is called the version, and the thing on the right is the name. The version is what's important. And it doesn't have to be an integer version of a timestamp. It just has to be unique and orderable. And you can see how Rails uses this version if you trace through the SQL that gets run when you run rakedb migrate, which I've done. The first thing you'll see that gets run is this SQL statement here, where we're selecting all of the version, we're, we're selecting the version column from the schema migrations table. The schema migrations table is not something that you manage yourself. It's not going to be in your schema.rb file. It's something that Rails creates on demand when it runs migrations for the first time. So Rails takes this list of versions. And, it, and, and those are the versions that it has recorded as having been run on this database. And then it looks at the list of versions from the, file name, from the files that are on your, in your migration path on the file system. And it diffs the two, and it says, any that exist on the file system that do not exist in this migrations table are what need to be run, and we'll run them in the order of that version column. After it successfully applies one of the migrations, it runs this insert to record that has been run. And that's how we prevent running a migration twice. You can get insight into how this works with this handy rake task, or Rails task, I guess we're calling them now. Um, if you run Rails DB migrate status, you'll see output that looks like this. So it's essentially that cross-reference between the file system and the versions of your schema migrations, in your schema migrations table. Anything that has a status of down is what is going to run the very next time you run rake DB migrate. It's interesting occasionally to run this command on your production instance, because it can return interesting results. So if you see, so here in the lower right, you see that this, there's a stat, there's, on the last row rather, you see that this migration version has, we have a, a record of this migration version being applied against this database, but we don't know what the migration name is because we couldn't find the corresponding file. So there's a few different reasons why you might see something like this. If you see a list of no files at the beginning of your migration history, generally that means somebody came along and decided that like the weight of all these previous migrations was just too much for this code base to bear and decided to delete them or maybe roll them all up or something, but didn't know to clean out the migrations, the schema, uh, the schema migrations table of those versions. Not that you would really need to, except for the accuracy of this command here, I guess. Um, you'll also see them at the end, which you see here, and that happens frequently when you're developing locally. Generally, that happens to me when I was working on a branch that had a migration, and then I quickly jump back to master or another branch that doesn't have a record of that migration, and you'll see this no file thing. They tend to get resolved as you merge code back into master. When you see them in the middle, that's really where you have like the forensics exercise to go through. What I found is generally, but not always, the reason why this, the migration was removed is that somebody tried to run old migrations and they no longer applied, maybe because we didn't have that compatibility layer or any other reason that we'll talk about later. Um, and so they decided instead of fixing it, they would just delete the migration because who needs that anyway? So <laughs> what about when we go in the opposite direction, we roll back a migration? 
If you define your migration with separate up and down methods, it's really no different than the process that we discussed earlier of going through the adapter and generating SQL. Where it gets interesting is if you define your migration with a change method. So here, this migration, we've decided that we no longer want to have separate first name and last name columns. Instead, we'd rather have one name column. So we wrote it with change to add our new column and then remove the two, the two old ones. Now, the idea of change is that we should be able to get, we should, Rails should be able to figure out what the, down, what the down migration should be from how up looks. So the idea is that we get down for free. If, the, if I learned anything from my high school economics teacher, shout out to Mrs. Buchanan, uh, it's that there's no such thing as a free lunch. So I wanted to know how. I want to know who's paying for lunch here. So the answer is that what Rails calls the command recorder is what's paying for lunch. And so you can see the shape of the command recorder here. It starts, its instant state is just a list of commands. And it provides a single method called record, which just shovels on the command onto that array. So when we define, when we, when we run, when we roll back a migration that has been written with that change method, the very first thing that happens is we actually run that migration, not against the adapter to generate SQL like we talked about before, but against the command recorder to record the commands that it ran. So in order for that to work, we actually have to have corresponding, we have to have corresponding versions of each schema statement that we want to be reversible. So here you can see just a couple of them, create table, and then we just record that create table was called with these arguments. Same for add index. Same for basically everything. These are actually metaprogrammed in under the hood. And then when it, goes, when it comes time to actually invert the meaning, we have to have a corresponding invert underscore version of that method. So here you see invert create table, invert add index, invert rename table. The top two are what Rails calls straight reversions because they have the same arguments in the same block if provided, but just change the method name. So create table becomes drop table, add index becomes remove index. The last one is an example of something that does a, something a little different. So the inversion of a rename table is still rename table, we just swap the order of the arguments. So if we jump back to our migration for a second, does anybody know what will happen if I try and roll back this migration as it's written? Anybody other than Sean? <laughs> so what's going to happen is we'll get an irreversible migration error. Because remove column can only, be, can only be automatically inverted if it's given a type. So SQL doesn't need to know the type to remove a column, but it does need to know the type to add a column. So here we haven't given it enough information because the column is no longer around for, us to, for Rails to say like, hey, what was, what was the type of this column before? because it's gone. So we have to overcome this by tacking the type on to the end, which seems a little weird because remove column didn't need to know the type. We're only doing it because we need to provide this extra context because we're defining this in a change method. Nonetheless, we've now defined a reversible change. And so if we run rake db rollback, we're going to execute this migration against the command recorder. If we stopped right there, just as it, just as it executed against the command recorder and asked the command recorder for its internal state, right, that commands array, we would see this. So it's an array of arrays of arrays or something. Um, but we have our call to add column and our two calls to remove column. What happens next is Rails says, OK, give me that in reverse, because we have to do the operations in reverse, and also invert each one of the steps. And we invert each one of those steps by calling the corresponding invert add column, invert remove column, et cetera. So what we end up with is this. So we have our two add columns, because we need to add back our first name and last name. And then we remove our new column, the name, the, the name columns. So now we can execute this list of commands, not against the command recorder, but against the connection and the adapter to, to generate SQL and actually invert our migration. Ta-da. So, but remember, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So what if that column that we, what if one of those columns that we removed in the original migration had a null false constraint or a default value associated with it or it defined a foreign key, something like that? We still need, as we saw kind of when we tacked that string on there, we still need to actually think about how we'd go about writing that down method if we were writing them separately when we're writing change. So we don't really get it for free because it's not magic. The only way to tell that you've actually successfully written the change migration properly that I know of is to migrate your database and then roll it back and then check for a difference in your schema. So that's how applying and reverting a migration works. Let's talk about how schema.rb gets generated. This is what schema.rb looks like. It's essentially a single migration that contains the entire current database state. And you can load up the entire current database state on a fresh database by running db schema load, which will load this file and run it basically just as if it were a migration. My daily use for it, and as I was talking to a lot of people for, the, for this talk, their daily use for it as well, is as a reference for 
what columns exist on this model? Or when you're writing a query, can I expect this thing to perform reasonably? Do, are there indexes on the columns that I'm using here? But how is it actually generated? Well, we know it gets generated automatically when we run migrations or if we run the DB schema dump command. But what's responsible for doing that under the hood? That's the active record schema dumper. And this is what it looks like. We start the process by calling this dump class method here. And if you notice, the dump class method actually asks the connection to create an instance of the schema dumper. That's another example of the adapter pattern at work here. And that allows PostgreSQL to have a separate uh, connection schema dumper than uh, like SQLite would, for example. So once we have an instance, we call the dump method on that instance. And dump is broken down into four parts. And it's easiest to see what each of these four parts does by looking at how it gets reflected in the generated schema. So here's our schema again. The header is just that top part, the comment at the very top, and then the active record schema defined block. Extensions, if you're running Postgres, you'll see something like this. And you may see other extensions like HStore or PG Crypto, whatever else you might be using. On any database other than Postgres, this is a no-op. It doesn't output anything. Tables is what actually does all the work. So this gives me a list of all the tables, a list of all the columns on the tables, a list of indexes on the tables, and then finally, uh, a list of all the foreign keys between the tables. It's important that those foreign keys come last and separately rather than in line because the tables have to exist in order to create a foreign key between the two. And then trailer does the all important work of writing the end to make this valid Ruby. So essentially, the schema recorder is Ruby code that inspects the current state of your SQL schema and writes executable Ruby code that will generate that schema again, hopefully. So the schema file attempts to justify its existence beyond a reference with this giant comma block, comment block at the top of the file. And it says a few interesting things in there that I wanted to highlight. First, it claims that it's the authoritative source for your database schema. So <laughs> that makes me think a little bit because it strikes me as aspirational at best. Uh, the database is actually what's authoritative, right? If you've ever written execute inside of your, if you've ever written execute inside of your migration and done any sort of DDL statement manually, then chances are pretty good actually that this schema file is not authoritative. But it may be, so hey, okay. Uh, <laughs> it goes on to say that if you wanted to recreate a new instance of this database, that you should be using DB schema load to do so, not running all migrations from scratch, because the latter, running those migrations from scratch, is a flawed and unsustainable approach. The more migrations you amass, the slower it'll run and the greater likelihood for issues. So that, of course, made me think oh, as well. So let's examine those claims. The first is that it's just gonna be too slow. I've never actually seen schema migrations on an empty database be slow. Maybe somebody out there works at GitHub with like years and years and years of hundreds of developers of migrations and can tell me that it is a problem. But I think for most of us, it's really not an issue. I'm gonna throw it out because it's not a particularly compelling argument. What about greater likelihood for issues? What do they mean by issues here? I think what they mean is what I refer to as migration rot. So migration rot has two primary causes historically. One is that the meaning of our schema statements might change over time. And the second is that we're using external dependencies in our migrations. Now that first one is largely lessened or maybe even eliminated by that compatibility layer that I talked about earlier. So let's throw that part out. What about migration, what about, so migration rot is largely caused by the latter, this external dependencies use. What I mean by that is, well, let's look at an example, I guess. Uh, we're gonna revisit our previous name migration, and between adding the column and removing the two other columns, we're gonna have this call, this, this block here in the middle which says, hey, on the way up, uh, update the user's name to concatenate their first name and last name column. So what happens if we change the, let's, let's say we change the user model to author. Right? This migration can no longer apply because it's going to run against the current Ruby code that you have. We'd actually have to check out old code where the model was called user in order to successfully run this. We can get around this by switching to use SQL instead. Right? So we do a, a single SQL update statement here. This is also going to be much, fa much faster on large sets of data because we're not going to run you know, 10,000 updates to update users. We're just going to do it in one SQL query. Another common technique for getting around this that you might see is uh, people, will jet, people will create active record classes in line, right? So they will create a user's class, because, or they will create a user class because they know at the time this migration runs, the table is called user, and so it'll be okay to do that. The key really is that you want to eliminate a dependency on anything other than the state of the database when you run this migration. 
<clears throat> so mind your dependencies is great advice for programming in general. And if possible, you want to depend, in, in the context of migrations, you want to depend on nothing but Rails, the Rails schema statements itself, because we have those, now have those great compatibility layers, um, and the state of the database. So migration rot is an example of particular shortcoming that can come up, but there's some more, so let's dive into those. So, like I said, migration rot. This can be mitigated by mining your dependencies or maybe rolling up your migrations into or your old migrations if you're that type of person. Or just saying, I'm never going to run old migrations. I'm always going to use schema.rb. That's always good enough for me. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> some people will say that migrations tend to further remove you from the underlying database. Right? This is, that, that is, this is the, the uh, counter argument to what DHH was calling conceptual compression in his, in his keynote. And to that, like, I, I actually think it is really useful to know SQL and to know it well, but I don't think it's particularly interesting or useful to know uh, DDL SQL. Because when I need to generate a table, I can look it up. It's, it's not, like, that's a pretty quick thing to look up. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a concept, really. It's just a, what words do I have to type to make it happen? So another common shortcoming cited is that the, the migration DSL only has support for a limited subset of features. And that's what actually rings true for me, and that's what I want to take a quicker look at. So for example, foreign keys are really useful in databases, and we've been using them for decades, but Rails didn't add support until 4.2. So I'm glad we have support, but that was an awful long time to go without support for foreign keys. Expression indexes, the ability to index the result of a function call on a column or something like that. Those weren't added until Rails 5.0. Database functions, we couldn't do those. We still can't do those. Triggers, nope. Database views, nope. So of course we can do these things because we can always execute whatever SQL we want in our migration. So that's a bit hyperbolic for me to say they're not supported. But if we, but once once we do this, they won't appear in that schema.rb file. So we're, we've kind of othered ourselves, right? Our code is now somehow different. If we cared to have them dumped into some sort of record that we could load on a database later without running all the migrations, we'd have to do this, which we can change our schema format to SQL and say. Instead of trying to make my, my schema into Ruby, just ask Postgres to dump the SQL, please. And the problem with this, every time I've had to do it, is that it feels unrails like There's always a resistance, like, oh, I really kind of liked schema.rb. Like, we're not going to get, so if, if we start writing, like, execute statements to create functions, we're no longer going to get down for free. We're going to have to manage that ourselves. ourselves. Uh, we're gonna, in order to do that, we're going to have to keep track of, like, what was the old SQL so that I can run that on the way down to re restore it, and things like that. So. What if we tried to provide some of those missing behaviors in the most Rails-like manner possible? I wanted to do this, so I started to dig in. And the unfortunate thing is that there is no official API to do this. That, of course, makes me sad, but it's never stopped us before. <laughs> <clears throat> so gems that do this have existed for a long time. Foreigner allowed me to use foreign keys on Rails applications for a really long time before it was essentially merged into Rails. Schema Plus still exists as a collection of, of things that um, that can add various extensions to your database. And so I wanted to create one that did database views in what I would consider to be like the most Rails-like po way possible. So together with a friend of mine, Caleb Thompson, uh, we set out to add support for database views in the most Rails-y way possible. And we did that by developing a thing we call Scenic. So because we wanted to be the most Rails-y way possible, we knew we were going to need, for example, methods to call in our migrations. So we were going to need schema statements. We wanted down for free, so we were going to need a command recorder. And we wanted, we wanted to keep using schema.rb, so we knew we were going to need to enhance the schema dumper in some way. So our schema statements just look like this. And the implementations here are interesting, but left blank, because this isn't a talk about Scenic itself. I'm happy to talk your ear off about that later if you have questions. But essentially, all, we, all you need to know is that we define a handful of, of uh, schema statements that you see defined here. OK, so that's our schema statements. Now we need to enhance the command recorder because we want down for free. <clears throat> so here's our command recorder. We know it needs to respond to each one of those, each one of those schema statements. So we define create view, drop view, and update view to record those. And then we define invert versions of those. So invert create view becomes invert drop view. That's just one of those straight inversions. And the other two do a little bit something interesting because they have to basically inspect the, um, the state of the arguments that were passed into them to figure out if it's reversible, and then do some sort of uh, swapping on the arguments to handle that. But that wasn't too bad. That was pretty straightforward, all things told. And then we got to the schema dumper. So in order to enhance the schema dumper the way we wanted to, we had to override the tables method. 
So we say, hey, when you go to dump the tables, go ahead and do that, but then also dump these views. And so we had to define what does views mean. And this, is, this was an absolute bear to write. <laughs> um, it went through several versions, and we've got it pretty good now. Uh, but it was certainly difficult and would be a talk unto itself. So how do we wire all this up? Well, the first step is that we need a rail tie to hook into the Rails initialization process. So rail ties get run every time you initialize Rails, and, and our, rail tie, our rail tie says, hey, anytime active record gets loaded, call this scenic.load method. And scenic.load does three things. It hooks up our schema statements, it hooks up our command recorder, and it hooks up the schema dumping that we want. So those are three monkey patches. And sometimes uh, those monkey patches conflict in interesting ways with other monkey patches for things like this. And that leaves authors to figure out how to work together because we, we both need to monkey patch the same thing. But nonetheless, this all does work. You can write an update view statement in this little uh, schema statement language that we've developed here. Um, but there are some frustrations with the approach. Every time I think like, okay, this, we've got this just right, interesting things happen. Like the first thing that bit us pretty early on was like, hey, views can depend on other views, so the order in which you dump them matters. And oh, when you try and update a view that is depended on by other views, you first have to drop those views and then update the view and then recreate the view. And so it would be, wouldn't it be nice if Scenic automatically did that for you? Like, well, yeah, it would, but now we gotta figure out how to do that. What about materialized views? So we support materialized views because you can, they're basically cached tables and you can index them and get really great performance. But when you update a materialized view, you basically wipe out the table and its indexes, and then you're left to try and remember to apply those indexes again. So wouldn't it be nice if we automatically did that? So okay, we had to try and figure out how to do that. And it turns out, uh, through, through this process, there was a lot of frustration. And to me, it turns out that what I thought, I, I thought Rails didn't support database views, for example, because there was some sort of conceptual, or, or um, I don't know, some sort of resistance to them as a, as a concept, to know that application engineers didn't need to know about that concept. But what I think actually is that maybe there's some of that at play, but also that Rails has kind of picked the low-hanging fruit here. These problems are pretty tricky, and they're very database specific. So all of this work led me at one point to say, what if we didn't do any of this? What if we got rid of all of this code and we used SQL migrations instead? We've described, what we've described is a lot of Rails code. It's a lot of code that's running in your application to support you. And now we're starting to hit the limitations of that approach. We wanna take more advantage of what our database can do for us, but we're just hitting that wall. And so I really thought about this and I think, well, SQL migrations could look almost exactly the same, right? There'd be a version and there'd be an up.sql and a down.sql. And maybe even if, like, if we wanted to keep all that code around, they could even coexist alongside Ruby migrations. And so the more I thought about this, the more I realized that really, <clears throat> maybe you've heard of this process of this 80-20 rule before and really that and in preparing this talk, I discovered that it actually has a name. It's called the Pareto Principle. And that states that for many events, roughly 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. So in our example, the small subset of database functionality exposed via migrations, which is probably more than 20%, but we'll say, let's call it 20% for now, that's our 20%. And that actually accounts for a large portion of what we need on a day-to-day -day basis or even month-to-month -month or application-to-application -application basis from, that, from, from SQL DDL. There's actually a lot of value in the higher level abstraction that Rails provides. Earlier when I was talking, when I was showing the SQL, I was talking about how like, look at all the stuff I don't need to know, right? In the DHH parlance, look at all the code we're not writing. And we could go even further with what's provided here. How many out there have written, have, have written a migration to create a new table, pushed it to production, started gathering data, and then realized you forgot to include timestamps on your table? And so now you, now you have to decide, like, okay, I guess I'm gonna cre create those timestamps and then mark everything as like, created at and updated at now. Well, with migration, with, with this higher level abstraction, with Ruby migrations, uh, and particularly with our compatibility layer, we, can actually, we could conceivably solve that problem by just making timestamps default with create table statements. And that's, that's just one example of something that we wouldn't be able to do with SQL, but that I believe Rails, and Rails developers would actually appreciate. So, Ruby migrations, it turns out, I think they're actually the right solution for Rails. There'll always be room for extensions like Scenic and Foreigner and, and Schema Plus and all those other things, but it is kind of hard to envision them providing as good an experience of, of, uh, as, as what Rails currently offers in the migration DSL. The one thing I would say is that maybe we need to become a little more comfortable with making that jump to uh, structure.sql 
when it comes time to uh, rely on some more advanced database functionality. So that's all I have for you today. Uh, as I said, if you have any feedback, I'd love to talk to you afterwards, or if you want to tweet me, you can tw tweet me at, at Derek Pryor. If you like the technical content of this talk, I host a podcast every week with my friend Sean Griffin here where we talk about things just like this. Uh, so you can check that out at bikeshed.fm. And if you're interested in learning more about ThoughtBot, then please come see me afterwards as well. Thanks a lot.